Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the last session of the first day of symposium. Um, I will be chairing this session in place of Sarah Turner. She was not able to be here. Um, so my name is Amber Stowell, and I'm the laboratory manager of the Regional Science Consortium. So um, during the talks, if you could please talk into the microphone, we're actually live streaming this to YouTube so that people who are not available to be here today can view your presentations. If you would like to later view your presentation, it will be archived on our YouTube channel. Um, it's, the YouTube channel is ReachSci TV. Um, presenters, these are all speed talks, so you'll have 10 minutes total. I will hold up signs to indicate when you will have two minutes and one minute left, and then a stop sign for when you should stop speaking. Um, there's also a clicker up here that has a pointer on it and also a forward and backward button. And I'll introduce you during, um, before each talk. So we could start off with David Bobkin, Evan Woodsick, and Jeb Bortz from Gannon. They are undergraduate students in the environmental engineering program. Good afternoon. Our presentation is regarding our senior design project at Gannon University, which is the design of a wastewater treatment for Erie Waterworks Summer High Plan. My name is Evan Wojcik, and these are my colleagues. <coughs> my name is David Bofkin. Jeff Woods. So the background behind the Erie Waterworks Summer High Plan, it holds a maximum capacity of 45 million gallons per day of clean water, uh, which the actual clean water production varies seasonally, winter being roughly 20 million gallons per day, and summer being roughly 27 million gallons per day. On average, daily, 1.5 million gallons per day of wastewater is produced from this plant, and that's the issue we would like to deal with with our design. The Area Waterworks Summerheim plant process is listed below, as well as an aerial view of the plant itself, uh, labeled different process processes and uh, different areas of the plant. Uh, one technology I would like to point out, this being a different uh, wastewater treatment facility or a water treatment facility is the membrane filtration, which is a relatively new technology in the water treatment <coughs> field. So the 1.5 million gallons per day of wastewater being produced from the plant is our area of concern. The Erie Waterworks plant is, uh, they are charged monthly per raw water turbidity from the uh, wastewater treatment facility. You can see the monthly bill for the Erie Waterworks for this past 2017 fiscal year. Uh, the total amount is based on their solid, which is that raw water tur turbidity, and the actual amount of water, the flow, and they get a grand total each month. The flow charges are based on a total of $324 per million gallons with an average monthly bill of roughly $70,000. So our aim would be to design a pre-screening or pre-treatment for this wastewater before it's sent to the wastewater treatment facility to ultimately uh, reduce that turbidity to reduce their monthly bills. So like I said, the problem right now is this uh, wastewater is sent directly to the wastewater treatment facility and they are uh, charged at cost due to that turbidity uh, and that wastewater is not treated on site Therefore, that wastewater is sent directly to the wastewater treatment plant for its process there, which we are proposing to design an apparatus to pre-treat or pre-screen that wastewater before it's sent to that uh, wastewater treatment facility to reduce their monthly bills. And the suspended of solid accumulation throughout the plant is unknown throughout each stage of the uh, water treatment process. So that would uh, entitle us to do a mass balance throughout the plant taking different samples from different processes uh, during the treatment and determining where that solid accumulation is being held. Okay, so we have two primary objectives uh, for this project. Our first one is to design an efficient and economical wastewater treatment uh, apparatus for Erie Waterworks, mainly um, focusing on turbidity removal. This is because they pay for uh, their wastewater um, that deals with the turbidity of it. And the second objective that we're gonna look at is 
um, to look at what stage in the facility is there going to be accumulation of solids. That is the second problem. So for our plan and proposal, we will first do total suspended solid screening, and this is when we will determine how many solids are uh, at each step of the facility, facility, and then we will do a grain, grain size analysis, and this is when we determine the size of the particles in the water. We're gonna mainly focus on particles that are less than 250 microns in size. Uh, the next step we will do is a mass balance. This is when we will uh, take water samples from each stage in the facility to figure out how much solids are being lost or accumulated within each uh, step. And that, then next we will look at uh, possible solutions that we are uh, proposing to uh, treat this problem. We will, with these solutions, the possible solutions, we will do a cost analysis looking at initial cost, final cost, uh, costs over uh, long-term savings and then we will design and customize a uh, treatment apparatus and by doing this we will try to make a prototype with AutoCAD drawings and then in Gannon University we will try to uh, create a bench scale prototype. Alrighty, so uh, for our potential solutions we came up with at this time, our first is going to be the hydrocyclone centrifugal separator um, as seen on the right. It, some of the advantages to this one are there's no moving parts. So as the water enters through the, the top left, it'll make a, like a centrifugal motion going down, carrying particles down through the tube, and the particles will set, settle out in the bottom. And as that happens, a vortex of water is created that goes back up to take the clean water out through the top. And then the particles are um, bended out through the bottom. And another, another advantage to this is it's low cost and it's easy installation so you don't have to worry because um, you're paying for just the unit itself and the flow is what does the work through this one. Um, as an average cost it's around ten thousand to fifty thousand dollars depending on the size of the unit and it's a very efficient process at around 98 percent of solids um, that have a specific gravity of 2.6 or higher so that's your average sand and heavy silt and it has a capacity per day of anywhere as small as four, depending on the size, to 7,800 gallons per minute, which are about 10 feet tall. Um, and that's like the whole apparatus from top to bottom, not including the piping to get everything out. So our second potential solution is gonna be a filter press. Um, some advantages to this are cost reduction for the waste removal, and it's a self-discharging and cleaning unit. The, um, the water comes in from a retention pond and filters through all the plates and all the presses. And it, what it does is it makes, like everything bunches up and the whole system will aerate through the plates and it, retain, it removes all the moisture. And then after it removes all the moisture, the plates separate and the filter cake is dropped out. Um, this has an average cost of 100 to $2 million depending on the size and all the options that you can get with it. Um, the one, the picture shown here has a lot of options as far as the bag, the whole stand and everything. Um, and the efficiencies on this are 99% solid recovery due to the, uh, the microns of the filters that are inside. Um, it only retains 10 to 15% moisture content. So you don't have to worry um, about like drying the samples after they're like discharged from the unit. Um, and the internal capacity is from 0 0.01 to 17 meters cubed and that's the volume in between the plates. So you get 17 meters cube of cakes out of it each time it discharges. So some of the constraints that we're gonna have are space, obviously. Um, they have an old building there that we can use uh, to put the apparatus in. It's 100 by 100 square feet. And um, so the things, another constraint is gonna be cost, obviously. Um, the initial cost to setting the whole thing up. Um, we have to look at that. The operational costs of daily use, um, if you have like just maintenance and general stuff like that, and then you have long-term savings. Um, we're trying to obviously reduce their bill to save them money, so we're trying to find the cheapest option that we can do that and save them the most money. Um, so there's a small list of references, and that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions?
guys. Okay. Next up, we have Blake Dantio, Billy Morris, and Stephen Hauser, also from Yale University, De Department of Environmental Science and Engineering. Thank you very much, Amber. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for being here today. Um, so we're from Gannon University's Department of Environmental Science and Engineering. And the topic of our presentation today is going to be sustainable waste management, focusing on yard waste products, particularly grass clippings. Uh, my name is Stephen Hauser, and these are my colleagues. I'm Blake Dantio, Billy Morris. So the problem that we're going to address today is the amount of yard waste being deposited in landfills or in municipal solid waste. So uh, recently a lot of states have begun to outlaw the deposit of yard waste into MSW. Uh, so yard waste pretty much consists of grass clippings, leaves, and twigs, which are all biodegradable substances that take up a lot of space going into landfills. So looking at EPA averages and studies over the last couple of years, nationally, Yard waste takes up roughly 10 to 15% of municipal solid waste. So that's a pretty good chunk of space in landfills. So we begin to dig a little bit deeper and looked at Pennsylvania, for instance. And in PA, 34% of their municipal solid waste consists of yard waste. So that's about a third of landfill space being taken up. So we focus more on grass clippings and about 10 to 15 percent overall of municipal solid waste consists of grass clippings. So we're looking at alternative possibilities of using grass clippings for uh, another another method or a way to remove them. So by removing grass clippings from municipal solid waste, we could potentially increase landfill longevity, lifespan, reduce uh, waste management or waste collection companies' transportation costs as well as potentially create a type of sustainable waste product using grass clippings, which we'll go into further detail. So some potential opportunities with the grass <coughs> clippings would include waste to energy, uh, composting the grass clippings, which is good for economical purposes, because an accelerated uh, composting rate is a highly desirable effect. This can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as the overall odor of the compost. Um, another opportunity would be to create a biochar so biochar is just a charcoal that is produced from plant matter heated at high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. So this biochar can be uh, implemented as an amendment for soil, which is good for agricultural purposes because it can increase the overall water holding capacity as well as increase carbon levels. And this biochar can also be implemented to water filtration to remove compounds through activated carbon absorption. And activated carbon is just high volume pores that increase the overall surface area uh, for absorption or chemical reactions. So our overall goal is going to be to reduce the amount of yard waste going to a landfill by producing a biochar using the grass clippings. And then we will overall build and test biochar based water filter that can remove So our plan is to uh, produce biochar of grass clippings using a process of pyrolysis. Uh, this process is done in a reactor. I'll get into the process of pyrolysis a little later. Um, after producing the biochar, and depending on the type of biochar that we're producing, we'll, we'll uh, activate the biochar using either a chemical process, which uses a strong acid, weak base, or neutral salts, or using a physical treatment, like pumping an inert gas to the biochar. After this, we plan on testing the adsorption capacity of the biochar to determine the capabilities and of, the, uh, of the char itself. And this is done using batch isotherm tests. After conducting uh, these tests, we'll compare it to activated carbons that already exist uh, on the market commercially. And we'll see how they stack up and whether or not it's, it's a feasible product. Then we'll design, build, and test the water filters Biochar has the capacity to remove chemical, biological, and physical contaminants, such as phenol, chlorines, or heavy metals. For our purposes, we want to focus mainly on lead and arsenic, but there's also potential in uh, removing other chemicals and, and other types of contaminants. 
then after that we'll do a cost benefit analysis to determine um, how the biochar stacks up and if we can produce it. So the process of pyrolysis is a method of decomposition at high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. This is typically conducted in a closed reactor, such as a fixed bed reactor, which is the most common, but there are also rotary kilns, fluidized bed reactors, and tubular reactors. Uh, the process of pyrolysis is heating without burning, so it allows byproducts to retain their carbon structure instead of uh, emitting other oxides like carbon dioxide or uh, nitrogen and sulfur oxides, as there's an absence of oxygen because it's they use the gas to remove any excess oxygen that's left in the reactor. And then depending on the temperature, the time, and the pressure that you use uh, can produce a number of different uh, products. We're looking mainly for low ash content biochar, which can be produced around between 200 and 350 degrees. Uh, but it can also produce oil or a waxy substance, the char, and then combustible gases like syngas at higher temperature. So some of the constraints that we're anticipating that we'll encounter uh, are pre-treatment of grass clippings. This pretty much pertains to uh, residual fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides used on the grass that could be could still be present uh, prior to using the grass clippings in the, in the R reactor. So right now we currently are just washing the grass clippings to remove any dirt or fecal matter. Uh, another constraint would be uh, soil composition. Uh, so there's always the possibility of organic or uh, heavy metal concentrations being present in soil, which could be leached into the grass, which could affect char quality. Uh, another one would be technology limitations. The PAR reactor that we currently have on campus is only able to go to up to about 300 degrees Celsius. Some literature review that we've conducted uh, states that optimal low ash content char could be achieved somewhere between 300 and 350 degrees. So that could be another limitation. Uh, consistent sources of grass is probably going to be one of our biggest ones since the majority of our testing is going to be conducted in the winter months. And it's tough to get grass in winter with the snow. And safety constraints also that we'll probably encounter is uh, dealing with high pressure and high temperature scenarios with the reactor. We'll have to really take a lot of precautions and perform them in enclosed, enclosed scenarios just to make sure that uh, no accidents happen to us and protect the animals. So here's some of the references for the literature that we've conducted. And uh, I'd like to thank you guys very much for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Does anybody have any questions?
All right. Our overall objective is to design new components that will make this dump site more sanitary without completely changing what they have. Um, the first step in doing this is going to be to develop a leachate collection system, and for this we'll need to um, determine the volume along with finding proper piping, which will involve finding piping that's available in the Solomon Islands that's also <coughs> cost effective. Um, we'll also need to develop the, whole, the final holding site we'll, where we'll store the leachate. Um, we're also going to look into a cover soil that will create drier conditions and cover the trash to reduce the exposed oxygen and organic material. So our plan is to um, come up with what Maddie was uh, previously saying is a, using the HELP model, which is the hydrological evaluation of landfill performance. This will give us a basis of how much leachate we are expecting, and then in turn, what, kind, what size pipes and so on, and uh, holding on what we need. Um, the second thing is to contact officers of the Solomon Islands, which we have um, contacted a few ladies, and uh, they have they have great um, knowledge of the dump site and are branching out and kind of we're uh, connecting with other officials as well. And the um, third thing would be to study different uh, resources that they have, mainly their main exports, exports which is uh, timber, um, fishing industry, which that's not gonna help us too much, um, copra, which are dry coconut kernels that they get the oil from, um, cocoa and palm oil. So by using these byproducts of their exports, um, we can look at um, diff their absorption, how they absorb um, different gases that will be coming off the landfill to reduce odor, um, then reducing the moisture content in the dump. Um, this will be very cost effective since they are byproducts of their main exports and it will, uh, it will be great economically since they are developing countries. So with this project, we're going to have a few major constraints. Um, it's first and foremost to note that we're not going to be able to create a U.S. standard landfill because the Solomon Islands aren't a U.S. territory. So because of this, we can't enforce any laws. And currently, the dump site is open to the public so that they can go and kind of scavenge uh, recyclables and sell those for profit. Another big constraint that we're going to have is we can't physically be there to analyze the site. So we're going to have to get that information from a third party. Also, there's going to be monetary limitations. Like Matt said, this is a developing country, so it's important to note that we can't make the most expensive um, design system. Along with that, material availability kind of goes hand in hand. We need to pick something that is economically uh, viable for the Solomon Islands. The fall semester mostly has consisted of research and we have started constructing the help model to figure out how much leachate we're going to be dealing with. The spring semester is going to focus more on the overall design of the whole project, the cover soil and the piping and everything as a whole. So are there any questions? attempted to use Google Earth to zoom in on this place, are you able to actually see the site that you're going to study um, using that tool? So we tried looking on Google Earth to find some good images of this, but we couldn't find it. So one of the first things that we're going to have to figure out with the Solomon Islands, um, the women from over there, we're going to have to find out the exact location, if they can disclose that. But from our research, we couldn't find it. How responsive have these people really been? Um, actually, the two women that we talked to, one was on vacation one week, and then the other was on vacation the other week, so it's kind of been a little difficult to all kind of gather the information from them, but we're still working on that. It sounds really hard to be for you to get anything other than very vague and general information about the area or the elevations or anything that you could actually do any sort of calculations with it sounds like it's going to be challenging if you don't really 
uh, push hard to get somebody there interested in what you're doing. Okay. Why don't you just do a little funny and come and go? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I wish we could do that, but due to the us graduating in uh, May, we probably wouldn't be able to swing that. But <laughs> we, yeah, everybody keeps asking about that. <laughs> you go ahead. Um, so, is this the the main island in the Solomon Islands sort of chain? Yeah, it's one of the main uh, large. This one main large. Uh, one of the nine major islands. So, do they have a university on this island? Because one thing you might think about is reaching out to someone at the university who might be able to help you get that information yeah. as well as partner with them. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's yeah, a that's great idea. idea. Yeah. I know there is a small amount on this university, I just don't know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Hona Hour is their capital. So yeah, I mean, that would be there. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Yeah. Especially idea. if it's an open place where people can go scavenge, if there's someone there who's willing to go, they could probably go some really good pictures and information. Right. Well, we, we all have been able to gather their uh, waste percentages as far as what's organic and inorganic. So that will be that'll play a large factor in the different things. Which there might be some students there who the project for the spring semester. Yeah. That, would, that would be really cool to collaborate with another yeah. university. So thank you. Dr. Kim at Gannon University. Um, we're looking at the spatial distribution of heavy metals in sediment both at, um, in Presque Isle Bay and along the beaches of Presque Isle State Park. Uh, we're looking at 20 different heavy metals in the sediment, in the water, and in tissue of zebra mussels to, see, um, to try to determine the driving force behind the distribution of heavy metals. The main objective of our research is to determine the spatial distribution of the heavy metals uh, in the bay and on the beaches. Uh, we're also collecting water samples. We're looking at basic water quality parameters um, such as pH, conductivity, we're looking at temperature, dissolved oxygen. Um, we began looking at phosphate. Uh, we've also decided to look at other anions such as um, chloride, sulfate, and nitrates to see if there's, um, if they contribute at all to the distribution of the heavy metals that collect in the sediment. Um, we're looking at quagga mussels. Uh, we're looking at the tissue to look at the bioaccumulation to determine if any of their biological processes influence the, um, the heavy metal deposits in the sediment as well. We chose Presque Isle because as, as many of you know, um, it has a long history of industrial use in this area, um, not only from the atmospheric deposition in the water. Um, we've used Presque Isle Bay as a sink for all sorts of um, contaminants from the industrial use. Um, you can see here we chose three locations along the beach. Um, beach one, beach uh, we were between Beach 6 and 7 due to the construction that they're doing out there. We started on Beach 7 and had to um, kind of backtrack this last time we sampled. Uh, we sampled at Beach 11 and then we have five different locations along the bay where we were able to access um, both the mussels and the sediment all in one place. Um, the area was also considered an area of concern. Um, it's been taken off the EPA's list of concerns in 2002, but for those of us that live here and we use this area for recreational purposes such as boating, uh, swimming, fishing, it's still an environmental concern for this area. Um, we started by collecting sediment. When we were at the beach, we just walked out and it was fairly easy to get the sediment. We just um, used a shovel, went out about at, at two feet of depth and used a shovel to collect the surface sediment. 
it was a little trickier once we got to the bay because the depth of our samples were anywhere between four and eight feet deep. So um, Amber was kind enough to loan us a Ponar dredge so that we could sample the sediments in the bay. Uh, once we got the sediments back to the lab, we laid them out for, uh, about, for seven days so that we could sieve them using a um, US standard sieves. We found that the the samples that we got along the beach, they were all uh, fairly well sorted, fine sand. We had a little more gravel in the samples that we were collecting on beach one. It was a little, little more poorly sorted, but all in all, it was a nice clean sand that we were getting off the beaches. Uh, once we got to the bay, it was a little more poorly sorted. Um, there was a lot of gravel, and as you can see in the picture on the right, that some of the some of the layers were just almost all mussel shells because we were collecting the samples directly off the pier where most of the zebra mussels lived. Here's a better picture that gives you an idea of what the bay sediments look like when you pull them up. You can see they're full of organic matter and um, mussels, some live mussels, some were just shells. Um, all of our analysis for sediment was done on um, on very fine grain samples, um, 710 micrometers or smaller. We also are looking at the pH of the sediment as well as the organic content. As you would expect, the organic content is quite a bit higher. That's what's in the orange there. It's the percent that was lost on ignition. Uh, you can see that the organic matter was quite higher in the bay than it's been, and the water is slightly more acidic in the bay than it was along the beaches. For mussel collection, we created this mussel scraping tool where it's basically just a garden hoe that we attached um, a little pencil basket to. And we needed to, all of our mussels we collected from a depth of about 1.5 meters. So we put an extender handle on it from a pool tool so that we could just lean over the side and scrape them off the, off the side of the sea walls. Um, all of the mussels that we are looking at are adult phyga mussels. They're between uh, two and three centimeters in, in length. They were all collected from about the same depth, so we can sort of compare the same thing. Um, most people have heard about the zebra mussels that have invaded Lake Erie back in the 1980s. We're actually looking at a uh, slightly different species, the quagga mussel. Uh, I found this identification guide on the US Geologic Survey, and it shows some of the differences. Um, the zebra mussel has a more distinct basal groove. You can see it, where on the quagga mussels you can't. Uh, the quagga mussels are also a little more asymmetrical along the mid-ventral line. Here's a better picture so you can see the comparison. When you see them side by side, there's actually quite a bit of difference. The, the size of them, uh, the zebra mussels are very triangular on one side, where the, the quagga mussels on the right are a little, a little rounder. They're also a different color. So once we separated those, we had to prep them for metal digestion. Basically what we did was we took a scalpel tool and cracked the shell open and then scraped out the insides. And then we, we cooked them for, for 24 hours at 100 degrees so that we could get rid of all the moisture content. And you can see the difference from the left onto the right. There's quite a bit of moisture content inside of them. We also looked at um, basic water quality parameters. We did most of these when we were out in the field. Um, we did looked at chemical oxygen demand back in the lab, but while we were out in the field, we tested for dissolved oxygen, uh, temperature, pH, conductivity. Uh, here are the results. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of comparative results at this time because we're still just in the sampling process. We looked at ion concentrations, and uh, surprisingly, the phosphate levels were not as high as we thought they would be. We haven't been able to detect them using the um, absorption, absorption spectrophotometry. Um, we compared that to, we also looked at total phosphorus with the hatch spectrophotometer, and we were getting, occasionally we would get 0.01 milligrams per liter, but they were almost just below the detection limit. Um, we're looking at chloride, sulfate, and nitrite, which you can see here, they vary from um, 
time to time that we sampled. Um, chloride seems to be a little higher than we expected it to be. Like I said, right now we're still in the sampling process. We don't, have, we haven't done a lot of comparison or analysis. Um, we're, we just began metal digestion this week, so we're hoping to be able to start doing metal analysis by January. Um, we have one more round of sampling to do, which we will be doing the end, either the end of this month or the very beginning of December. Um, our other parameters we're currently measuring and analyzing. Um, and we'll continue doing that for the time that we continue sampling. Does anyone have any questions?